All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel, which is all about income oriented investing. I have an extremely special guest. I don't keep saying that, but this is a really special guest. I have uh, Hamilton Rayner. He is from JP Morgan and actually is the fund manager, the main portfolio manager that manages JEPI, the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF and JEPQ, the JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity premium income ETF. So Hamilton, thanks so much for doing this, for taking the time. I know you're busy, got to write those calls and manage these funds. Thanks again for doing this. How are you doing today? I'm great, Adrian. Thank you for having me. I mean, it's important to have these conversations. And I love the fact that, you know, you do have these conversations for investors and doing this, you know, knowledge share, you know, on YouTube. This is fantastic. Well, I really appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Let's talk a little bit about yourself. So on your profile page there on JP Morgan, you have a lot of experience. So you're an act you're actually what I would pretty much say is the options or derivatives specialist. You were been uh, you've been with JP Morgan 14 years, but you have 36 years experience in the industry, starting ma to manage derivatives in 1987. You've been with a bunch of firms, you have a, a degree at uh, from Wharton School of Universe, you know, you're a very popular university. So tell me a little bit about Hamilton, um, sure. your experience and all that and your, your love of options. I love to hear about that. So actually, I went to the University of Pennsylvania to be a doctor. And okay. freshman year, I took classes in bio, you know, biology, and chemistry and all these other classes. And I did very, very well. But between my freshman and sophomore year, I fainted four times over the summer by seeing the sight of blood. So I felt as though I had the heart maybe even the brains to be a doctor, but not the stomach. So I then transferred into Wharton. And then in my okay. last years of Wharton, I really just became in love with options because options give you a very customizable experience. They truly give you the opportunity to do more than just buy a stock. You can buy a stock and protect it. You can buy a stock and generate some income. You don't even need to buy the stock. You can just buy some calls or buy some calls, sells and puts. It really right. is much more of a laparoscopic investment, Adrian. Yeah, I love options as well. I fell in love with it as soon as I discovered what is now the primary strategy of my personal portfolio and also of my channel, covered call ETFs, options strategies. A lot of people are scared and there's, you know, when they hear derivatives, options are scared. But, you know, I think it makes the market that that's what they typically say, makes it more fair, makes it more more stable. I'm sure you would agree with that. So, um by the way, Hamilton, it, are, you're not named after the legendary Alexander Hamilton, are you? Sorry, I just had to ask that question. I'm not, but I think uh, covered call uh, ETFs are definitely a revolution. So I think that's uh, I think that's the way I'll tie it together for you, Adrian. Okay, that sounds great. And speaking of covered call ETFs, JEPI, now the biggest covered call ETF, the largest active equity ETF on the US market, with over 21 billion in assets. That's huge. Also has a sister fund or a brother fund, JetQ, which is growing very, very quickly. And it's almost at 2 billion in less than a year. So very, very, very uh, popular. So let's start with, you know, just the basic questions. What, what is the official objective and mission of these two covered call strategy ETFs? Sure. So first of all, thank you for your, your kind words on what I would call uh, children that are, are not biologically attached to me because my strategies really are like my children, Adrian. I live, breathe, and, and eat them. And yes, my kids actually know I have these three other children. Um, <laughs> so, when I think, so when I think about uh, these strategies, I think it's something that's really nothing new, Adrian. You know, right. options were invented here. You know, I, 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 uh, I work in Manhattan. Options were invented down underneath some tree in lower Manhattan over a century ago for two reasons. One, farmers wanted to hedge their crops or two, they didn't know what to plant. And they said, you know what, if I can sell my crops in six months time at six bucks an acre and, and I know it'll cost me three bucks an acre to plant them, I can get that three dollars uh, today. And so what they think thought about then, which is no different than today, is let's get the bird in the hand of income, the burden they have, nobody can sell our crops for. Today, knowing full well, if it goes up, that's okay, I may forego some of the upside. And if it goes down, I'm pretty happy I locked that in. So let's bring that today into a call of right strategy. Well, a call of right strategy is you're selling, in some cases, at the money or out of the money calls. 
I firmly believe that investing is about balance. I always sell out of the money crawls because I want to give you some income plus some of the upside. So the investment goal here is really primarily income. And at the same time, I want to give you also some total return. Too many times people choose one or the other. I believe in balance. I want to give you a little bit of both. Very interesting. So out of the money calls is really what JP and JPQ does. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the specific strategy of those. I have questions related to those, but that's a great preview. So uh, when it comes to these two ETFs in particular, what would you say is, you know, they're designed for what kind of investor do you have in mind when these products came out or were, were originally designed or thought of? Sure. So I think what's really nice about call over right strategies is they actually can provide a couple different ways of fitting into a portfolio. Because my, my, my firm belief right now is portfolio construction is going to be very important with all the uncertainty in the world, Adrian. Right? We know that there's so much stuff going on that people don't know about rates, inflation, recession, elections, yeah. macro, geopolitical. And so portfolio construction is important. And strategies like call risk strategies are an important part of portfolio construction. So the way we're seeing people use, utilize our strategies, I would say is threefold. Number one, as an anchor tenant for an income-oriented client, just pretty darn good income in a call override strategy. And it gives it to you without duration risk and without credit spread risk. So it actually checks the box for a client that's seeking income. We also see a fair number of people saying, you know, when you sell a call, yes, you get income, but it also lowers the volatility and beta of your portfolio. Right. So it's also a more conservative way of getting equity market exposure and also seeking total return. So I obviously, not obviously, but I own my own strategies. And even though I am well experienced, as you put it, uh, I don't need the income yet. So I actually own my strategy as a total return strategy. And it gives you a multi-pronged approach to total return. You're going to get some dividends, some options premium, and then some of the upside. And it actually does something very cool, Adrian, in the fact that in a range-bound market, you would expect a strategy like this to do well. Yeah. Once again, portfolio construction matters. And then lastly, even though high yield and emerging market debt sit in a fixed income bucket, Adrian, they both have a fair amount of equity market beta. So if we can give you equity market beta and income, without volatility, excuse me, without duration, and without credit spread risk, it's a nice way to be a replacement for some of those asset classes as well. And we're seeing people use it in all three ways. I would say primarily the first two, though. You know, income-oriented clients or people seeking a more defensive way of getting invested in the equity market. I love it. I love what you said there. You pretty much described all the benefits, the advantages of a typical cover cost strategy. I love how you said, you know, it's really a balance. So you're writing out of the money calls. It's a to really a total, total return oriented uh, product. Um, I've said this before. I think it's a great replacement, you know, replacement in quotes of fixed income securities. Like you said, there's no there's no credit, you know, spread risk or whatever that is. Um, and typically, fixed income, you know, underperforms the market, the the, the equities over time. So I, I think this is a great you know, income product for people who typically go with the fixed income. Uh, and, and like you said, it lowers your volatility as well. So awesome points there. So when it comes to cover cost strategies, I, as you know, there's really two main factors. There's the portfolio coverage on how much of the portfolio are you actually, is the manager writing cover costs and the moneyness of the options, which we've already touched based on, you know, at the money versus out of the money. So can you explain when it comes to JP and JEPQ, those two factors, what are your, what is the methodology when it comes to portfolio coverage and moneyness? Sure. The first thing I would highlight, Adrian, is in neither strategy is there any leverage. You know, when people, and you start okay. off the conversation talking about, you know, options and options usage, the first thing people automatically think about around a strategy that uses options is like, how levered are you? As a starting yeah. point, my North Star is using options for outcomes, not for leverage. So there's no leverage in either one of these two strategies. Okay. The second thing that's important to me, is I firmly believe in active management when it comes to the underlying loan portfolio. Too often, Adrian, when people buy an index and then sell a call on it, unfortunately, the only thing buffering them to the downside is the options premium associated that you brought in. 
And so by having an active portfolio, we would help to have what I would call a less downside when the market goes down. Hopefully the act of security selection will help you lose less when the market goes down. And I think that's another big important uh, point or one of my North Stars. The other aspect is this, what you said, and that is when it comes to the calls and the call overriding. For us, we talked about balance. We always sell an out-of-the-money call. Now, we also help, the market will help us determine how far out of the money it is. When markets are, let's call it average volatility, on average, we're going to sell it anywhere from, let's call it 2 to 2.5% two out of the money. But when markets are more volatile, I kind of have a chance to have my cake and eat it too. I'm going to get more income and sell a call that's farther out of the money, giving my investors more potential upside. So, for example, you know, in if 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 when the VIX is, let's call it uh, 18, if you would normally sell something that's two, two and a half percent out of the money, well, you, you can generate a certain amount of income. Well, if the VIX goes to 25, you can actually sell a call that gives you more upside, selling calls three or three and a half or four percent of the money and have more income. It's about balance. It's that conversation I had with you earlier about let's not have all of our eggs in just the income or the total return bucket. Let's have a foot in both. Yeah, volatility helps cover cost strategies excel. It makes those premiums a lot richer, like you said, which is why I absolutely love it. So uh, it's obvious you guys have an active approach, not a system, uh, you know, or a dynamic approach, not a systematic or set in stone approach when it comes to the options um, and, you know, selling the options. So why did you decide to do that? You know, you kind of, you know, pretty much touched base on that. Do you see yourselves always having an active active approach on these types of products? I would say that we have a very disciplined approach in the fact that we are going to balance upside and income. It's going to be a little bit geeky, Adrian, and I know you're an options geek, but for the others on the call, the, the approach and philosophy that we take is trying to identify an option that has a 30% chance of finishing the money. So if I told you with the VIX at 16 or 17 or 18, yeah, a 2% of the money call over the next month has a 30% chance of finishing the money. You'd be like, you know what? That smells right. That's, that seems about a fair number. But if I said to you, the VIX is twice that, 32, what are the chances the market can go up 2% the next month? You'll say, I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is, but I know it's higher than 30. Right. So as we seek to sell a call that's 30% chance of finishing the money, that number is going to go out to three or four or maybe even higher. So it's a very disciplined approach, but it's disciplined as far as higher volatility, as you said, is a friend of the strategy, giving us more income and more potential upside. Now, the other thing that's pretty interesting is, and this is something we've all run into, and that is, you know, from an options approach, we sell options at the index level. Many people, Adrian, as you know, sell options at an individual name level. Yeah. So if we're going to spend all that time and effort trying to find 20, 40, 60 or 80 great names, why do you want to actually cap any of the upside in those great names? So by selling options at the index level, I'll never have my securities taken away from me. But I still get a chance to reduce beta and I still get a chance to generate income by selling options at the index level. I think that's a big nuance versus us versus some of the other philosophies in the marketplace. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So your, your, your holdings in JEP, JEPQ, we'll talk a little bit about that later. The, the, your, you know, this is active management. You really believe in these names. You're not selling calls on the stocks. You're selling calls on the actual index, whether it's the S&P 500 for JEPI, I'm assuming, and NASDAQ 100 on the, on the JEPQ. Exactly. So the, the stocks within the portfolio capture the full upside, plus those index options that you're writing generate that, that income. Right. Yep. And, and there is, as you know, Adrian, there is no free lunch. When right. You sell an out of the money call in return for that bird in the hand of income. You may forego some of the upside. Right. But you still get to capture all the alpha of those names. Interesting strategy. Uh, first thing I noticed when I looked at JEPI, JEPQ, you know, in comparison to other similar products, your competitors, your MERs are very low. They're 0.35 all in for both of these funds, which is pretty rare, I would say, for a actively managed covered call strategy typically they're a lot more than that so is that because you guys are a, a big big firm and you're able to reduce the fees how come you have such great fees on, on these two products so first of all thank you um and when i think about when i designed and architected the strategy so i'm not just the lead pm 
um, I designed these strategies. I architected them. They, you know, they, they came from a lot of work on a whiteboard, if you will. And my one passion was I want people to like or love these strategies and not let fees get in the way. Let's never have a conversation with it. I would have bought it, but, and if you could take off the fee conversation, you have a chance of having some success and partnering with many, many clients like we have. And the other aspect is exactly what you said. I mean, I'm lucky enough to work in a, in a, uh, wonderful, you know, in, uh, a wonderful large organization that has a robust infrastructure. And I'm able to basically, in, you know, create these strategies with that as a backdrop. To be clear, as you know, and, and others on the call may know, you know, selling the options is just the tip of the iceberg. Everything beneath the ocean is significant. You know, you have to worry about collateral management, cash management, execution, um, uh, and all those other things that go along with that pricing, um, uh, settlements, mid office, back office, and having all that infrastructure in place enables me to have the scale to offer these products at, as you said, a very attractive price of 35 basis points. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that. Of course, it's appreciated, right? Lower fees as always puts, helps total returns over time. So my next question is really about the monthly distribution. So JPJPQ, Jep they make monthly distributions, which for a buy and hold income investor, which is what my strategy, what my, uh, my channel is all about, uh, is very appreciated. But I've noticed that, you know, they're different. Every month, the distribution is different. And from what I noticed, they're typically much higher. They, they go a bit higher when there's a lot of volatility in that month. So is that something you, you know, obviously the, the premiums are, richer when there's volatility do you expect that this trend to continue or are you guys maybe thinking or looking at maybe making the monthly distributions a little bit more stable make, maybe taking the average of the last 12 months or something like that or just continue with this strategy of varying monthly distributions so when we think about distributions adrian yeah we believe on a monthly basis we will distribute net of fees, 100% of our dividends, and 100% of our options premium. Okay. You know, when markets are more volatile, we get more premium for our options and our distributions are going to, we would expect them to increase. Now, some people have asked me, you know, why not just, you know, you know, save some of that income for a rainy day? And I believe that if markets are more volatile, your clients, my clients, our clients, deserve to get that income that they earn by being invested in more volatile times in the strategy. So every month, net of fees, we've had 100% of our dividends and 100% of our options premium. And you're correct, it varies, but it still varies at a quite attractive level. It's not exactly the same amount, but it, it's, it's, it varies at, a, at a, what I would call an attractive level that truly helps clients in their portfolios. Awesome. That's that's exactly what I want to hear from my covered call ETF manager. I want everything. You know, it's all about the income for me. So that's greatly appreciated. And here's a, a just a quick question that I always forget to ask uh, on the U.S. side. You no, know, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I know that the Canadian tax system, but on the U.S. side, you have a different tax system. Option premiums are taxed. How are they taxed? Is it uh, obviously this is, you know, Jeppy Jep is going to be a combination of option premiums and dividends as well, but how are option premiums actually taxed? Is it ordinary income or short-term capital gains? I know you guys have a bit of a different sure. system in Canada. So I'm not allowed to give tax advice. So I'm not going to give tax advice. So it'll only get me in trouble, Adrian, but I'll no tell problem. you what, how I think about the strategy. Yeah. There's two parts of our distributions. Yeah. There's going to be a component that is dividends. And we would expect those dividends to be qualified in, in a strategy like Jeppy, which is based, you know, similar, you know, with based on S and P five hundred names. Okay, the dividends are going to be a little bit higher than Jep Q because that's based on the Nasdaq, and Nasdaq does not pay as high a dividend. Correct. Now the options premium is going to be treated as ordinary, and the reason it's going to be treated as ordinary is because we want it to be bona fide income. And it's our understanding that option premium in the U.S. is not income. It's potential capital gains. And almost all the strategies in the U.S., Adrian, that we're aware of, either have or will have return of principle. And the idea of someone having to explain to their client what return of principle is, the idea that an investor would have to go in and recalculate all of their cost bases for all their clients, we think is suboptimal. 
Um, so what we do is we hold our some equity market exposure plus our short options in a short term equity linked note. And what that vehicle does is it converts the options premium to being a bona fide coupon. So it's real income, bona fide income, not cap gains, not potential cap gains, but bona fide income. And I would love to tell you that I invented this idea of equity linked notes. I didn't. A very large income manager from the West Coast over three decades ago wanted to own an income oriented, excuse me, an income oriented strategy, wanted to own a non dividend paying stock. And they couldn't buy it by prospectus purposes. Okay. So what they did was they bought the stock, sold a call against it, put it into a note, and that options premium got converted to a coupon so that they could own it. So this is something that's been used across multiple multi-asset income-oriented strategies, across multiple income-oriented strategies. You know, I just think that we brought this to the 21st century and put it in a traditional call over strategy, Adrian. Very interesting. And that was actually going to be my next question. So JP, both JP and JPQ hold ELNs, equity linked notes, which is very unique compared to other cover call, you know, ETFs out there. Can you explain exactly, you know, you already touched upon this. Sure. What are these ELNs? Why you decided to hold these in uh, JP and JPQ? Is, is the purpose solely for, ta for tax efficiency or is there another reason why you have those in there? Sure. So in, in order to ensure that we have bona fide income and not return of principal, we actually use equity link notes as a delivery mechanism. In our equity link notes, it's a combination of two things, some equity market exposure plus short options. And by doing that, our options premium is therefore paid out to our investors at a bona fide coupon when it comes to traditional income reporting uh, vehicles. Now, when you think about the equity link notes, by prospectus, we're capped at 20% in both strategies, but it tends to live you know, at a 4% max. In addition, uh, uh, excuse me, it tends to live at a, uh, at a 15% uh, uh, average. And in addition, by 40 Act rules, you can have up to 5% in issuer and we tend to have a 4% max. So putting all that together, we're well diversified across issuers, mm -hmm. we're well diversified uh, as far as limited to how much we can use. In addition, the term of them is quite short. Just over a month is our longest one, with the average being about two and a half weeks. So the short term in duration, we have many different issuers, we're capped as to our issuer size, and we actually tend to have you know around 50% of the strategy in these equity link notes, Adrian. Very, very unique. Uh, thanks for that explanation. Very much appreciated. I see all kinds of YouTubers trying to explain what those are. So you, you think you're about it purely as a delivery mechanism. It's a way to actually hold uh, some equity market exposure plus our short options to ensure that we distribute bona fide income on a monthly basis to our investors. Adrian. Fantastic. Easy enough. And another thing I noticed, the composition of the fund. So Jeppy is trying to track more the S&P 500, but there's not 500 holdings in there. There's about 100, a little over 100, including the ELNs. So, and Jeppy is the same thing, you know, it tries to follow the NASDAQ 100, but there's 80 names in there. So I'm assuming this is my assumption. You, you guys are actively <coughs> picking and choosing the stocks, uh, but, you know, 100 stocks versus 500 stocks. Is it because you want to do a little bit more defensive than owning the S&P 500? Or what's the methodology there, how you pick your stocks? Absolutely. So let's just start with Jeppy as a starting point. Yeah. You know, we have, once again, you talked about JP Morgan as a wonderful large franchise. It is. I'm also blessed to have, you know, you know, you know uh, over 21 fundamental analysts that look at well over 500 names. And what we ask them to do is look to the medium term, find those stocks that are in the medium term that are most attractive. But then we say within those attractive stocks, what stocks have less price volatility and less earnings variability? And then we build a portfolio capping every name at 2%. That way we have, don't have too many eggs in one basket and we cap every sector at 17 and half percent. So we're well diversified to build a portfolio between 90 and 120 names, currently about hundred, as you said, of what I would call steady eddy stocks. These stocks are not going to be value. They're not going to be growth. If anything, it's got much more valuation, uh, valuation driven. And these stocks we expect to be higher quality. And the reason we chose this, Adrian, is because when markets sell off, we want to have a portfolio that hangs in a little bit better when the market sells off. 
too often call over our strategies, as you know, are capped to the upside and yield the downside. We don't want to yield the downside. This more defensive equity portfolio, it tends to about a 0.8 beta. It's going to be more defensive when the market sells off. And then when you put the options on top of that 0.8 beta, the overall strategy is going to have about a 0.65 beta of the market. So we expect the strategy about 35% less volatility and beta in the market. That's for JEPQ, Adrian. Yeah. For JEPQ, it, with 10 names equating to 55% of the benchmark, we're going to be a little bit more like the benchmark. We're going to own names that I would call it. We're going to have a portfolio that's going to be closer to a beta of one to the NASDAQ. But selling the options on the NASDAQ reduces that beta to about 0.75 beta to uh, to uh, the NASDAQ. So around 25% less volatility and 25% less beta than the NASDAQ. And that's nice because here we are in the market where last year tech got taken out to the woodshed. And so did growth. What better way to think about re-engaging with tech or growth than to buy something that generates a fair amount of income like JEPQ and a more defensive way of re-engaging with tech and growth. And we're seeing a lot of people re-dip, as you said, back into those type of investments with mm -hmm. this strategy. You know, as you said, we're just under $2 billion in just under a year. So we're quite excited for people to re-engage with that part of the market and generate a fair amount of income. Yeah. So what I heard there, keyword defensive, it's more of a defensive strategy than owning just the, the indexes outright. I think that's really, that's really smart, especially in this type of environment. And speaking about this type of crazy environment that we've been in, in the last couple of years, have you noticed a higher than, I certainly have higher than normal interest in option strategies, covered call products uh, in particular lately? We have because when I think about, we talked about portfolio construction before. Yeah. I mean, from 2011 to 2021, Adrian, it didn't feel easy, but numbers don't lie. I think average market returns were about 12%. Average volatility was 12%. That's a ratio of one. Long-term returns, that was about 20% above average for stock market returns and 50% less volatility. So when you think about the next decade and investing, Building a portfolio that is not just concerned about return, but also managing to risk is the sweet spot for option-oriented strategies. As, I, as we talked about earlier, you and I, um, call overriding, people automatically get focused, laser focused on the income. We also have to give those options a little bit of credit for lowering volatility and beta yeah. of the portfolio. They don't get enough credit. It's like that part of it is sometimes missed in the wash. So when I think about the next decade of investing and why I think we have seen significant growth in, in option-oriented strategies is they, they seek to do balance, return and risk. And you know that to me is one of the, 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 uh, the best ways of thinking about investing is how do I actually maximize return, but also do it within how much risk my, I'm willing or my clients are willing to take. Yeah. Awesome comments there. I, I talk about this too. I talk about the next 10 years, you know, if, Investors that are just recently started, they look at the last 10 years and they see this magnificent bull run, right? And that another thing people tend to laser focus on covered call ETFs is typically the lower total returns compared to just the index. But I always say, hey, that's the last 10 years. We don't know what the next 10 years is going to bring. Maybe there's going to be a lot more volatility, a lot more instability. And this is where these products are really going to shine. So that's typically what, what you know, how I feel about it anyway. So. I would agree. The one thing I would encourage your listeners to think about as well, mm -hmm. and I know it's something you constantly answer, as do I, is often as people get laser focused on NAV, NAV is the price. You can't ignore all the distributions that you've gotten, you know, year to date, month to date, whatever it may be. You need to think about total return as far as your NAV plus your distributions from a total return perspective. Um, and I think that's going to be important as well as we look forward, Adrian. Yeah, I, I, I'm super happy you said that because actually, I think the number one criticism and probably you guys get with these products is the stock price. The stock price doesn't go up that much. Well, you're only looking at the NAV, which means you're only looking at the stock price return. You're not looking at the total return. You've got to factor in all those juicy distributions. And if you actually factor them in, for example, Jeppy, Jeppy beat just the S&P 500 by far 
in the last year. So you have to always focus all always on total returns, not the stock price return. If you're looking at Tesla or Amazon, there's no dividend, there's no income. Look at the stock chart all you want. But then I always tell people if something is giving income, you have to factor that in. So thanks so much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, coming down to the end here, I, I don't want to hold you on too much. Uh, I know you're busy, but uh, leverage cover call products, they're kind of all the rage in Canada now. So I'm sure you, you know um, that we have a product uh, on the Canadian side called HYLD, which actually 30% of it holds JEPQ and, and, Jep, and JEPI. So they're becoming very popular. Have you considered creating leveraged versions of JEPI or JEPQ or maybe even an all-in-one solution where you combine several of your covered call ETFs, you put it together, maybe slap on some leverage there to increase the yield. Have you guys thought about that? Are you thinking about that? So from a leverage perspective, you know, we, we, we believe in giving you the unlevered version that if you cho- choose to lever it in your, in your, in your, you know, broker dealer okay. or your process, happy to give you, I want to give you the, 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 the raw product so then you can decide to lever it however you want, one to one, one half to one, one a quarter to one half. But you bring up another good point. You know, I talked about my strategies being my children. And, and oftentimes people say, well, which one do you like better? Do you like Jeff better or do you like Jeff Q better? And what I always come back to, Adrian, is let's first start with what do you want from an underlying portfolio perspective? What do you want that long portfolio to look like? If you already have a fair amount of growth and a fair amount of tech in your S&P, I think Jeffy would be a really nice diversifier because that long portfolio is going to be different than the other two of those. Now, if you're underweight the S&P and you're underweight tech, then maybe you want to add a little more tech in a more defensive way and you own something like a JEPQ. And we also see some people thinking about combining the two yeah. where you can actually take, let's call it about, you know, something close to about 40% in JEPQ and 60% in JEPI. And the overall sector bias just look very similar to the S&P 500. Similar, not exactly similar. Yeah. So I believe when you think about strategies like this, first start with, what type of underlying long portfolio do you want to have? Because the income is going to be good. It really is. You know, through a cycle, we would expect, you know, JEPI to have seven to nine and it falls higher north of that. And through a cycle, JEPQ nine to 11. And if, and if it's uh, through, a, you know, and if it's always higher, higher than that. But too often people say seven to nine, nine to 11. They're both really good. The underlying long portfolio is something that adds value. You want to be a little more growthy or a little more defensive, or do you just want to be in the middle of the fairway? So I think that's one of the really important things. If you do these strategies and do them well, the income will come into your portfolio. Being thoughtful as to what's the centerpiece of it is, I think, a, a critical decision. And I think these building blocks that we've shared with clients is a, is a nice way of thinking about it. That's fantastic advice. It's something I, I tell my audience all the time. You know, they focus so much on the ETF, the cover call ETF. But remember, you're really investing in the stocks inside the portfolio. You can't lose focus of that. Cover call, just adding a cover call strategy, it, you know, for some people it's very abstract, but you're still investing in that portfolio of stocks. You got to be happy with that portfolio. So I really appreciate you talking about that. So I understand you guys typically fund managers. I try to ask this question all the time. You're not allowed talking to me about it. And even if there are new products in the pipeline, but are you thinking or looking at creating maybe other similar covered call products down the line, maybe some equity ones like one that tracks more the small cap, like the Russell 2000 or the Dow, or maybe even some fixed income cover cost strategy, which have started coming out now on the US side. Are you guys constantly looking at that or do you feel like we're good with those two? I'm always thinking, I, I, I love being innovative, Adrian. I think it's one of the most fun part of my jobs. My, one of the most fun part of my job. I think it's so exciting to actually you know, create a strategy and nurture it, watch it grow. It's it's truly like a child. I think it's wonderful. And I think one of the things that I'm cognizant though, of Adrian is you want to make sure whatever you launch, is not just a good product, but it has a a robust liquidity profile. And it's not robust liquidity when things are good is when things are not so good. Right. And so if you take a look at a strategy like Jeppy, you know, we made it fully transparent such that the market makers can provide tight bids and offers. And as you can see, it trades well over $200 million a day, a penny wide. And Jeff Q trades over $40 million and it's 
a lot newer, you know, a penny or two by. And that's, to me, very important. We want to make sure that hopefully it's only in, but if clients want to get out as well, they're yeah. able to get out in a very seamless way. So when I think about product innovation, I want to make sure the underlying assets are liquid because that will enable a strategy to grow and develop and, and not be put in a situation where you could disappoint an investor. The last thing any of us want to do is disappoint an investor. And so I think sometimes what I would call boutique or niche things get put in ETF. And unfortunately, you end up with a, a, a challenge that if you are successful, you could then be put in a position of disappointed clients. So if I were to think about new products, I would have to make sure that the underlying assets, both stocks and options, were extremely liquid. I'll defer to my fixed income brethren whether or not a fixed income ETF would be interesting. But with the move index at those very elevated levels that we see today, it would definitely be interesting from, a, from an investment perspective, I would think. Very interesting. And in case anyone from my audience is listening, doesn't really know what liquid means. It means it's very, it, there's heavy trading, which means you could get in and out and sell your, your units pretty much at the market price. So it's, you know, the more liquid it is, the easier it is to get in or out and things like that. I always say, you know, the liquidity, me for me personally, this is just my, my personal opinion, not that important because I am a diehard buy and hold investor whenever i buy something i just want to hold it forever and what better thing to hold forever than something that pays you every month that's kind of like my motto but hey i i understand that uh like you said the more niche stuff doesn't have much volume it could be a little bit harder to get get out especially so uh hamilton well, it's, also make it easy, yeah. it's also make it easy for you to get into it as well adrian into it as well yeah mm -hmm. you you get you get at the right price you don't have to pay a a, a, exactly. a, premium, a premium for it or anything like that yeah so exactly. listen i i really appreciate your time i think my final question before i let you go is there's a lot of instability right now we we're hearing bank failures on the u.s side some rescues the fed is going to speak in like 50 minutes if they're going to raise interest rates or not so there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of especially newer investors if you could give just a couple of maybe even one piece of solid advice for regular everyday retail investors who are trying to navigate all the language what would that piece of advice be so i think it's i think you know we, we always talk or heard about diversification yes well, with diversity is it's not having all of your eggs in one basket. The second thing I believe in, Adrian, is also, you know, everyone knows, I would think, how to make money. You buy something, it goes up a lot. Also understanding how to not lose money and being more defensive and things go maybe wrong is also equally important. So this idea of risk management, knowing yourself, knowing that you're never going to, like you said, you're a buy and hold uh, folk, uh, gentleman. Well, you know what if the market goes down one, two, three, or five percent, you know, you're gonna hold it. Building a portfolio that you never feel like I gotta get out. Right. And navigating these more turbulent markets. And you just went through it. There's a lot of known unknowns. And there's gonna be a lot of unknown unknowns. And having the ability to get invested and stay invested is incredibly valuable. And these call override strategies by giving you multiple ways of winning. In our case, some dividends, options, and some of the upside, having less volatility, expected to have less volatility made in the market, are all ways of helping becoming individual risk managers, helping people get invested, stay invested. And when things look not so great, having the conviction to stay invested. I mean, it's one of those things that if you look over time, it's not hard to get out, but it's really hard to get back in. And making a portfolio that helps you not really have to get out over the long term is a great way of compounding wealth. Golden advice. I really appreciate it. Sound advice. Diversification. Make sure you you, you stay in, in into quality assets uh, so you don't have to get out. So really, really awesome. I, I, Hamilton, I really appreciate this. I appreciate your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you come back on, on the channel. But on behalf of my audience, uh, which is mostly Canadian, but there's Americans too, uh, we just want to say thank you for offering such fantastic products. I hear from people all the time, retirees that are literally living off JEPI, JEPQ, and they couldn't be happier with that consistent source of income. So we want to say continue the fantastic work. We really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me, Adrian. Truly my appreciate pleasure. it.
Hey, don't go yet. I have some important reminders, including some more recent ones, and I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. And for everything that I'm about to discuss, the links and in, in, in info are in the video description below. So first of all, if you didn't know yet, I do offer a one-on-one -on -one coaching session where you'll have a one-hour Zoom call with me where you could ask me all the questions you want, and I'll help you and assist you best I can. Just remember that I'm not, not a licensed or registered financial advisor or planner. So to book a session, go on my website, passiveincomeinvesting.ca, and right there on the home page on the left hand side there is a small video watch that video to know how to book a one-on-one -on -one properly with yours truly also on my website you could purchase my digital product the ultimate diy investing package which is on version 4 right now it comes with lifetime updates so you only have to buy it once and this is really a reference tool or a companion tool to help you build your own portfolio according to your needs and your objectives it has a list of funds it has sample portfolios for both canadian investors investors and American investors. So make sure to check it out uh, on my website. I actually created a video which uh, shows the product from A to Z because I don't want you to spend money unless you know exactly what you're getting. So make sure to check that video out on my website and don't take my word for how good it is. Check out the reviews. There's over 300 of them and they are all 100% real reviews. So here's some more um, updated news or recent news. I am now on Blossom, a new investing app designed for investors. I've been using it for a few weeks now. I think it's really, really great it has a really cool feature where users could actually add and share their portfolios and what they're buying and selling every day so you could actually link your investing account so it's updated automatically on a daily basis i recently added my own main portfolio so you could follow how my portfolio is doing live and what i buy every month really really cool it's like a mix of Facebook and Twitter, but specifically for investing. So get on your phone, click on the link in the video description below and download the app. It's 100% free, so you two could share your portfolio. Just remember to look for me and follow me. My username is Adrian, P-I-I, altogether. Also, I do have a referral link for Quest Trade, so you could get $50 uh, worth of free stock purchases. This is the Canadian discount broker that I use and I recommend. Unlike Wealthsimple, the other popular discount broker in Canada you uh, you could drip everything you want it has all the stocks and it also has dual currency accounts very very uh, convenient if you're buying both Canadian stocks and American stocks I have a quest trade video by the way which shows gives you a little tour uh, of the fe features so make sure to check that out I also have a referral link for passive this is the portfolio tracking tool that I use to consolidate all our accounts to get a nice bird's eye view so you can cons for, you know, consolidate all the inf information together for easy tracking and stats as well. Also, our Facebook group, Passive Income Investing, is now an invite-only private group. So to join it, you need to click, click on, the, on the link in the video description below and give the group a like to get invited. So we take pride in making this one of the best investing Facebook groups out there with over 13,000 members. There's no scams, there's no spammers, and a negative and doomsday people we kick them out right away also follow us on instagram if you want a little bit more of our personal journey here in panama and lastly just remember everyone i am not a licensed or registered financial advisor this channel is all about my personal investing journey and how i invest to generate high passive income from a diversified portfolio of high yield funds it's for educational purposes only so don't forget to do your own research and due diligence and of course stay safe everyone stay healthy and of course stay passive see you next time